The 2016 election underscored the vast disconnect between red and blue America. The call for a national dialogue between both sides went largely unheeded. A recent article in The Atlantic entitled The Media Learned Nothing from 2016 calls upon the media to change its coverage of this year's presidential race. Atlantic staff writer James Fallows wrote that piece, and he joins me now. Welcome to you, James. Thanks very much for being with us. In Thank your you. Piece, you argue that, in your piece, you argue that President Trump's rallies and campaign events were given significantly more airtime than other candidates in 2016. Why do you think that happened? I think the reason is they were simply more entertaining, especially when he was beginning his run in the summer of 2015 and then through 2016. There's a dilemma for all of us in this news business where we have to constantly balance over the weeks and over the years things that are purely interesting for people with things that we think are in the long-term national interest. That, that Obviously, things have to be interesting or people won't watch or read. But in the long run, the distinction between news and strict entertainment, whether it's a football game or a car chase or whatever, is that we think there's some larger value. And I think in retrospect, the 2015-16 coverage was driven by just the spectacle value of seeing Donald Trump as opposed to Mitt Romney, you know, Marco Rubio, you name the candidate, giving a speech. Uh, in your piece as well, you talk about fact-checking and the importance of doing that uh, in this day and age. And we know, uh, for instance, during the president's earlier pandemic briefings, he was often contradicted by the very people who were standing alongside him, his own health experts, when it came to statements that he made. So there was some fact-checking taking place uh, in, in those times. But I want to ask you about something that Margaret Sullivan with The Washington Post uh, wrote about. You referenced her in your piece. But she wrote in a recent column about something called the backfire effect. Uh, and she referenced these academics who said this, quote, direct factual contradictions can actually strengthen ideologically grounded factual beliefs. So this idea that for some folks who are actually presented with the truth, it can lead them to retreat further into their false beliefs. If that's the case, then what do you think, James, the role of the media should be in that kind of environment that has emerged? You raise a really important and deep point, because in the world as of, say, five years ago and before that, we assume that politicians of, of any political view, they would spin things and exaggerate and push on the margins, as public figures always do. But they would try to, they would be embarrassed if they were called out with an actual factual error. And they would try to avoid doing that. And I, I contend, I think there's ample proof that Donald Trump is not so constrained, nor many people around him. And for example, his press secretary, Kelly McEnany, just flatly denying that he had ever downplayed or played down the risk of the pandemic when a tape had just been aired by Bob Woodward with uh, Donald Trump saying he always wanted to, to play it down. So I think there, it is the case that that what might have been the reflex in previous times of simply saying a politician has claimed X, actually there's evidence that X is not true, it may be that in this current situation that just solidifies, as you say, people's pre-existing beliefs. So I think this is part of the calibration we're all trying to do day by day. And maybe the answer is to feature things that we as journalists have established to be true and not run things that we believe to be false and uh, along with the contradiction. Yeah. In what instances, James, because you talk about this as well in your piece, but in what instances do you think that presenting both sides equally is actually a disservice to the public? I think it's a disservice when you have one of the sides that, that just is false. And I think that, that probably an example that could be um, in many people's memory is during uh, Barack Obama's time in office, where for four or five years, uh, there was a line of argument, again, prominently featured by then uh, you know, business person Donald Trump, that Obama had been born in, in Kenya. Um, think of this for a moment. For him to be born in Kenya, his mother would have had to be in Kenya. <laughs> and there was no evidence that, that uh, she had traveled outside the U.S. at that, at that time. Uh, so I think presenting, you know, Barack Obama contends he was born in America, but critics say he was actually born in Kenya. I think that that, that is um, something where just there are things that are 
that have gone through the exercise of trying to prove them and those that are just allegations and presenting them as if they're on a, a level playing field on the whole, just um, it deserves the public. All right. Uh, well, it is a wildly different information <laughs> landscape that exists now. Uh, James Fallows, we could talk to you all day about this. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your excellent, thanks for your excellent questions. I appreciate it.